Hi folks! The following video is going to talk about an elimination reaction called E2. In an elimination reaction, a base deprotonates an alkyl halide in a way that forms an alkene. Before talking about the E2 reaction, I want to talk a little bit about classifications of alkenes as well as stabilities. I'll start by talking about cis and trans designations for alkenes. Let's consider the following two alkenes, where each carbon of each alkene contains a hydrogen and a methyl group. These alkenes are similar but not identical. Notice that in the alkene on the left, the hydrogens are on the same side of the alkene as each other, where the sides I'm counting are the top and the bottom. So both hydrogens are pointed toward the top on the same side of the alkene. We would call this a cis alkene. In the other case, one hydrogen is on the top of the alkene and the other hydrogen is on the bottom of the alkene. We would say these are on opposite sides of the alkene. And we would call this a trans alkene. Notice that these two alkenes, although they don't contain any chiral centers, they are non-superimposable and they are not mirror images of each other. Because of this, we would classify them as diastereomers. A limitation of the terminology cis and trans is that they can only be used if each carbon of the alkene is bonded to one hydrogen. A more rigorous system for describing the stereochemistry of alkenes is known as the EZ designation. Let's consider the following two alkenes. Notice that these two molecules have different placements of the ethyl and fluorine group relative to the left side of the molecule. This means these molecules are not identical, and in fact they are diastereomers, non-superimposable and not mirror images of each other. Because the right carbon of each alkene does not have a hydrogen attached to it, we can't describe these alkenes as either cis or trans. Instead, to get the EZ designation, for each alkene carbon, you're going to assign the priority of the two groups connected to that carbon. This will be the same priority system that we used for R and S stereochemistry. For each alkene, imagine separating the two sides for the different alkene carbons, and what we're going to do is compare the substituents and their priorities for the carbon on the left, and then separately we'll compare the carbon on the right and its two substituents. On the left carbon of the alkene, we're comparing an oxygen to a hydrogen, and oxygen is higher priority than hydrogen. On the right side, Coming off of the alkene carbon, we are comparing a fluorine to a CH2 group. The higher atomic number of fluorine means it's higher priority. In the other alkene, we're again comparing off of this alkene carbon. We're looking at its two substituents, an oxygen versus a hydrogen, with oxygen being higher priority. And then in this case, when we look at the right alkene carbon, the fluorine is still higher priority versus carbon, but now it's in a different location, further up the page. Once we've assessed each alkene carbon and its substituents and assigned high priorities, then we can assign the EZ stereochemistry. We'll use the letter Z to describe the situation where the high priority groups are on the same side of the alkene, and we'll use E to describe having high priority groups on opposite sides of the alkene. Imagine considering the molecule through the alkene, 
the high priority oxygen is on one side of this and the high priority fluorine is on the other side of this. We would say that these high priority groups are on opposite sides, so this would be E stereochemistry. In the case of the other alkene, the high priority oxygen group and the high priority fluorine are both on the top part of the alkene, so we would describe this as Z configuration. For practice, I want to show you how I would assign E or Z configuration for the following molecules, if in fact assigning configuration is possible. For the alkene on the left, I've identified one carbon of the alkene and another carbon of the alkene. I imagine dividing my molecule between these alkene carbons. For the alkene carbon on the left, I'm comparing a CH3 group to a carbon that is attached to three other carbons and one hydrogen. The cyclohexyl group is higher priority than the methyl group. For this other alkene carbon, I'm comparing its substituents isopropyl compared to tert-butyl. The tert-butyl substituent has more carbons attached to it, meaning it's higher priority. If I look on the bottom side of the alkene, notice that I have the high priority substituents both on the lower half of the alkene. I would assign this as having Z configuration. For the other molecule, I want to imagine identifying the alkene carbons on the left and right, and now assigning priorities for all of the groups attached to those carbons. Comparing this aromatic ring to hydrogen, the aromatic ring, known as a phenyl group, is higher priority. And I run into a problem for the alkene carbon on the right. This alkene carbon has two methyl groups attached to it, and these methyl groups have the same priorities as each other. Because I was not able to assign a higher priority on the right-hand side, I cannot assign an EZ configuration, and I could conclude that this alkene is not stereoisomeric. I next want to talk about the stability of alkenes. One factor that affects alkene stability is substitution. This is the number of non-hydrogen groups attached to the alkene. If you have one carbon substituent on an alkene, you would describe it as monosubstituted. A disubstituted alkene will have two carbon substituents on it. The relative placement of these doesn't matter, just the number of them. If you have three carbon substituents on your alkene, you would describe it as tri-substituted. And a tetra-substituted alkene will have four carbon groups attached to it. The more carbon substituents are on your alkene, the more stable it will be. We can also see a trend in the stabilities of cis compared to trans alkenes. Cis alkenes, where the non-hydrogen groups are on the same side of the alkene, are less stable than trans alkenes, in which the R groups are on opposite sides of the alkene. The cis stereoisomer is less stable because these R groups are placed close in space to each other. The electron density in the bonds of each R group repels the electron density in the other R group and we have steric strain, a repulsion that makes this isomer less stable. The last thing worth mentioning in terms of stability is cycloalkenes, cyclic alkenes. We will only consider examples of cyclic alkenes that are in the cis geometry. Trans alkenes in rings are very strained, and so we won't consider these. With these foundational ideas about alkenes in mind, I now want to turn our attention to elimination reactions. In a beta elimination, the proton that's being removed from the molecule is beta to the halide leaving group. 
When this proton at the beta position is removed, it causes the formation of a pi bond of the alkene, and it kicks out the leaving group. Recall that the carbon that the halide is attached to is called the alpha position, and the carbon attached to that is the beta position. For the E2 mechanism, I'll be discussing for the remainder of the video, this is a particular type of beta elimination that I would describe as concerted, meaning all of the bond breaking and forming is occurring in a single step. The step as I draw it below is going to involve a simultaneous proton transfer and loss of leaving group. Here I've drawn a general form of an alkyl halide and my E2 mechanism is going to involve a CH bond at the beta position. I'm going to have three curved arrows. I take a lone pair from my base to form a new bond to the hydrogen at the beta position. I take the electrons from the CH bond and use them to form a pi bond. I indicate this by showing my arrowhead between the two carbons at the alpha and beta positions. And then at the same time, I take the electrons from the carbon halide bond and bring those electrons to the halide. This single step forms the pi bond of the alkene. I have a new bond between the proton and the base, and I've kicked out the halide anion. Notice that both the alkyl halide and the base are involved in the step, and so the rate is going to depend on the concentrations of each of these. The rate law will be that the rate will depend on a rate constant little k, the concentration of the alkyl halide, and the concentration of the base. Because two molecules are involved in the mechanism, this is a bimolecular mechanism, and this is reflected in the name E2. E stands for elimination, and 2 stands for it being a bimolecular mechanism. I now want to discuss what's known as regioselectivity for E2 reactions. Regioselectivity indicates that your reaction could have multiple constitutional isomers of product formed, but if a reaction is regioselective, one or more, but not all, of these products are the predominant product. This is also known as the major product. What's observed is that when a small base is used, meaning one that is not sterically hindered, the more stable alkene is the major product. This is called the Zaitsev product, after the discoverer of this regioselectivity. Let's consider the following alkyl halide, and I'm reacting this with a small base. You first want to identify the alpha position of your alkyl halide and all possible beta positions. Then I want to determine the substitution of these beta carbons. I would describe the methyl carbons as primary since they are only attached to one other carbon each, and the CH2 group of the ethyl group is secondary because it has bonds to two other carbons. If the base comes in and deprotonates a carbon-hydrogen bond from the CH2 group, then a pi bond will form between the alpha position and this carbon. I've drawn this product on the right. If instead the base deprotonates a CH bond from the methyl beta positions, you'll form a double bond between what was formerly a methyl group and the alpha carbon, and either of those methyl group deprotonations would lead to the following alkene, drawn on the right. So here I've drawn both possible products, and now I need to consider the size of the base. The alkene shown on the left is tri-substituted, whereas the alkene shown on the right is di-substituted. Because small bases favor the more substituted alkene, the tri-substituted alkene is the major product, 
and you could also call this the Zaitsev product. Some examples of small bases are hydroxide, methoxide, and ethoxide. If instead a bulky base is used, meaning one that is sterically hindered, the less stable alkene will be the major product, essentially the less substituted alkene. This will be called the Hoffman product after the discoverer of this regioselectivity. Let's consider the same alkyl halide as before, but now we're reacting it with a bulky base. Always identify your alpha and beta positions and how substituted the beta positions are. After the pi bond has formed between the alpha and the beta position that was deprotonated, the following alkenes would be formed. These are the same ones that I showed previously. The difference is which is the major product, or the product formed in larger amount. Because a bulky base was used, the di-substituted, less-substituted, and less-stable alkene is the major product compared to the tri-substituted alkene product. And if I wanted to, I could describe this major product, the less-stable alkene, as the Hoffman product. Some examples of bulky bases that will have this regioselectivity are tert-butoxide, diisopropyl amide, and triethylamine. These all have lots of bulky carbon groups surrounding the basic site, meaning that they are sterically hindered. We also need to consider the stereochemical outcomes for E2 reactions. One thing you may need to worry about is known as stereoselectivity. This is when you could form different product stereoisomers, but one or more of these, but not all of them, are preferentially formed. The product or products that are preferentially formed are known as the major product. For stereoselectivity of E2 reactions, we'll need to consider that transalkenes are more stable than cisalkenes which means that transalkenes will be more predominantly formed, or formed in larger amounts than their cis-alkene counterparts. Let's consider the following alkyl halide where I have a bromide leaving group. I'm treating this with the base ethoxide. I start by identifying my alpha and beta positions, and then I need to think about whether my beta positions have any hydrogens present on them. This beta carbon on the left is a part of a tert-butyl group, and it has no hydrogens present on it. So it cannot be deprotonated in an E2 reaction. Instead, my only site with hydrogens present at the beta position is the CH2 group on the right. Because I have only one beta position to worry about, I don't need to think about the size of the base. What I do need to think about is that when I have the pi bond formation between the alpha and beta carbons, the tert-butyl and methyl groups could either end up on opposite sides of the alkene, known as the trans or E stereoisomer, or the tert-butyl group and the methyl group could end up on the same side of the alkene, known as the cis isomer or Z isomer. The transalkene is more stable than the cisalkene, so this transalkene will be the major product. Another type of stereochemical outcome that we'll need to consider is what is known as stereospecificity for the E2 reaction. If a reaction is stereospecific, the stereochemistry of the substrate, in this case an alkyl halide, will dictate the stereochemistry of the product. Let's consider the following alkyl halide. My alpha position is chiral, and one of my beta positions is chiral as well. The alpha position has stereochemistry S, while the beta position that's chiral has R stereochemistry. 
I'm treating this alkyl halide with the base ethoxide. It turns out that the only product formed in this reaction has the following configuration. The phenyl group, which is an aromatic group, has higher priority than methyl, and then the high priority groups are the phenyl group and the tert-butyl group, and they're on opposite sides of the alkene, so this has E stereochemistry. Now let's consider a different diastereomer of the alkyl halide. I have the same stereochemistry at the alpha position, but now I have a dash to methyl instead of a wedge to methyl, and the stereochemistry of this beta position is now S. I'm treating this molecule with my same ethoxide base. In this case, the only product observed has the phenyl group on the same side of the alkene as the tert-butyl group. So this alkene has Z stereochemistry instead. And we're going to need to consider why is this the case. To understand the stereospecificity of the E2 reaction, we need to examine the transition state. The transition state is going to be the most stable when your halide leaving group is antiperiplanar to the beta hydrogen that's being deprotonated. Antiperiplanar refers to having a dihedral angle of about 180 degrees and having these groups facing in opposite directions. Let's consider the following generic alkyl halide. This CH bond at the beta position and the carbon halogen bond at the alpha position are anti-periplanar to each other. Let's imagine looking at a Newman projection where we're looking down the carbon-carbon bond. In our Newman projection, the hydrogen on the beta carbon would be pointing directly down, and the halogen coming off of the alpha carbon would be pointing straight up. We would describe this conformation as anti because this has a 180 degree dihedral angle. Once the molecule is in this antiperiplanar geometry, it can undergo the E2 reaction. This would form the alkene product. Here I've given two views of this. If I use the wedge and dash orientation from, from before, my alkene would look like this, and if I flipped it over so that it's flat in the page, it would look like this, with only lines instead of wedges and dashes. At the transition state, which is also antiperiplanar, several things are happening. I have a bond forming between the base and the proton. The hydrogen-carbon bond is breaking. A carbon-carbon pi bond is forming. And the carbon halide bond is breaking. I have partial negative charges on the base as well as the halide. So let's return to those two diastereomers of alkyl halides featuring two chiral centers. We're going to consider now the fact that we need the molecule to put the beta hydrogen antiperiplanar to the bromine leaving group. The first thing to do is to find the beta hydrogens and draw them out if they're not already drawn. In the case of the alkyl halide on the left, this is the alpha position. One beta position does not have any hydrogens on it, and the other beta position has a dashed hydrogen. For the other alkyl halide starting material, the hydrogen is a wedge instead. Next, you need to rotate about the carbon-carbon bonds in your molecule to orient your beta carbon-hydrogen bond antiperiplanar to your alpha carbon bromide bond. For the molecule on the left, I'm going to rotate my wedged bromine up to become a line pointing toward the upper right. When I do this, 
the dashed hydrogen that's not drawn becomes a wedge, and my tert butyl group becomes a dash. Then I'm going to rotate the left half of the molecule to take the dashed hydrogen and make it a line pointing toward the lower left. When I do this, the phenyl group becomes a wedge and the methyl group becomes a dash. Now that I've done this, my hydrogen and bromine are antiperiplanar. I imagine bringing in my ethoxide base and having my E2 mechanism. And which groups are wedges and which groups are dashes remains the same in the side-on view of my alkene. Because my phenyl group and hydrogen were both wedges before, they are still both wedges here. And then because the methyl group and tert butyl group were both dashes, they remain dashes in this side-on view. If I wanted to, I could redraw my alkene by rotating it slightly. And notice that here as well, the methyl group and tert butyl group are on the same side as each other. Now they're just lines instead of both being dashes. Now let's consider our other alkyl halide starting material. I'm going to rotate my bromine up to become a line on the upper right. This makes my dashed hydrogen a wedge, and it makes my line tert butyl group a dash. Then I'm going to look at the left side of the molecule and rotate my hydrogen down to become a line. When I do this, my dashed methyl becomes a wedged methyl, and my phenyl group went from being a line on the lower left to being a dash. This is the antiperiplanar geometry that I need for E2 to proceed. From this geometry, I imagine bringing in my ethoxide base and drawing my mechanism. And then here as well, any groups that are wedged in the starting orientation will be wedged here, and any dashed groups remain dashed. So in this case, notice that the phenyl group is on the same side of the alkene as the tert butyl group. I could pick up this molecule and rotate it to put all of my groups in the plane. Notice here as well, the phenyl is on the same side as the tert butyl. I want to end by talking about E2 reactions involving substituted cyclohexanes. There are special considerations we need to make for the anti-periplanar transition state for these. And you need to keep in mind that if your leaving group is a wedge off of your cyclohexyl ring, only dashed beta carbon hydrogen bonds can become anti-periplanar to that leaving group. And also vice versa. If your halide is a dash, only wedged carbon hydrogen bonds at the beta position could become antiperiplanar to it to become deprotonated and participate in the E2 reaction. Let's consider the following alkyl bromide reacting with hydroxide, an example of a small base. I've identified the two carbons that are beta to the bromine. And because the bromine is a wedge, only two of my hydrogens at beta positions can be anti-periplanar to it. The dashed hydrogen on the left and the dashed hydrogen on the right can both be anti-periplanar to this bromine. If I removed the dashed hydrogen on the right to form an alkene between this right beta position and my original alpha position, I would get the following alkene. Notice my methyl group was a wedge starting out, and now I'm drawing it as just a line. This is because this carbon of the alkene is sp2 hybridized, and so it's trigonal planar instead of tetrahedral. So all of its bonds need to be drawn in the same plane, which I'm showing as flat in the page. 
If instead the CH bond that is dashed at the left beta position is deprotonated instead, you'll get a pi bond between this left beta carbon and the central alpha carbon. And notice here, because I haven't touched this right beta position at all, the methyl group remains a wedge in this product. This is still a tetrahedral center, and its stereochemistry has not changed. I still need to figure out which of these would be my major product and which would be the minor product. Notice that the alkene on the left is tri-substituted, whereas the alkene on the right is di-substituted. When you use a small base, the more substituted and more stable alkene is the major product. Now let's consider I had the following alkene, where the bromine is still a wedge, but now the methyl group on the right side is a dash instead of a wedge. Here I've identified my two beta positions, and now I need to look for hydrogens on these beta positions that could be anti-periplanar to my wedged bromine. Only dashed hydrogens can be anti-periplanar to a wedged bromine, so only this one hydrogen can be anti-periplanar and can be deprotonated in the E2 reaction. Now that this hydrogen is a wedge, it is not suitable for the E2 reaction. This anti-periplanar hydrogen gets deprotonated, and a pi bond forms between that beta carbon and the alpha carbon. And because nothing has happened on the dash CH3 side, I'm showing a dash CH3 in the product. Because there was only one beta hydrogen that could be deprotonated in the E2 reaction, this is my exclusive E2 product. And it turns out that because there was only one beta hydrogen available to be deprotonated, the size of the base didn't matter in this case. All right, so to summarize, I started by talking about classifications of alkenes as either cis or trans, or E or Z. I also talked about alkene stability then I talked about the E2 mechanism. I talked about the regioselectivity, which is influenced by the size of the base. And I talked about the stereochemical outcomes for E2 as well. That's it for this video. I will see you in class.